Thank you for joining me on Fruitful Homemaker. On this episode, I have the privilege of interviewing Nancy Wilson, who is a pastor's wife and author of many wonderful books. Nancy has been one of the most influential women in my life about what is biblical womanhood and how do we portray that in every area of our lives. So this episode, we're going over virtuous. Um, what is virtue and how, uh, what virtue should we be adding to our lives? And also, all of her books really um, have been just wonderful learning contentment, her newest book, Single and Satisfied, uh, Fruit of Her Hands, have been so influential in my life. Um, and they're all, uh, you can buy them from Canon Press, um, which is their publishing company. So let's get into the episode. All right. Thank you for joining me on Fruitful Homemaker. I have with me Nancy Wilson, who has been a great blessing to my life. I have learned so much about biblical womanhood from her and have thoroughly enjoyed her books and podcast Femina. We will be discussing Nancy books, Nancy's book, Virtuous, a study for ladies of every age. And this book goes through 14 biblical virtues that we should be striving towards for God's glory. So Nancy, would you introduce yourself? Yes, hi, thanks for having me, Emily. I'm Nancy Wilson. I live in Moscow, Idaho. I'm married to Douglas Wilson. He's been a pastor here for over 40 years. We have three kids and 17 grandkids. The oldest grandchild is 23 and the youngest is five, almost six. So, and I am here, we live with my father-in-law. So my husband and I are helping take care of him with some of the rest of the family um, here in town, but we live on site with him. He just turned 94 yesterday. Oh, wow. All right, so let's start. Um, by learning more about virtue. What is it and why should we pursue it? Well, you made me do a real brush up on my book, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, well, uh, it's not an easy word to define, is it? But virtues mm -hmm. are good qualities. They're godly qualities. They're scriptural qualities that every Christian should be pursuing. And the scripture I wrote down here that got me going thinking about this was 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. And it's uh, it mentions, you know, add to your faith virtue and so forth and so on. You can read that. But we're to be actively engaged and working on different qualities and good biblical qualities and not just coasting, but actually pursuing trying to improve our walk with Christ by a godly character, giving it some thought and time. Uh, you wrote in the book that I really, I thought about a lot is we pursue godliness, trusting in, trusting that God will by his spirit do far more than all we can ask or think. And so that it's a reminder that it's God's work in us and that it's not by our own doing, but his and exactly yes so before i was converted in college i used to try to do things that would make me a better person mm -hmm. and eventually i started into transcendental meditation and i remember telling my roommate like you should totally do this it is great and she said why should i you haven't changed <laughs> and it was the most wonderful thing she could have done. It was like a big glass of water thrown right in my face. <laughs> so only the regenerated have access to the qualities that the Holy Spirit grows in us by means of just the fruit of the Spirit. So only the regenerate, only the people who are born again can truly grow in virtue. I mean, we can do some external things to make us look good, but we can't change our heart. And we can start a new program getting up earlier to do something that seems worthwhile. But until we're really born again, we are helpless. We can't change ourselves. We can't change our hearts. We need new hearts 
And that is the soil that the fruit of the spirit can grow in and virtue can grow in by the grace of God. That's right. All right. So now we will look or we'll talk about specific virtues that we should pursue. And who better to start with than the Proverbs 31 woman? So how does she show diligence in her life? All right. Well, I'm sure you can think of a lot of things. We know that chapter pretty well of all the things she's doing. But I was thinking about that. And let's talk about the things that you did today that make you a Proverbs 31 woman or the things I did. Well, I did some laundry uh, on a typical day. I may get to the grocery store where she's bringing her food from afar. Well, so am I. I'm just getting in the car and getting the groceries and bringing them home. And I'm getting the laundry in and ironed and put away. And I'm cleaning things up and I'm maybe cutting some flowers in the garden to bring in. You know, there's so many things. And I mm -hmm. think it's not about she buys and sells a vineyard. I think, you know, she's involved in business, but it's that in our days, uh, our typical days were to just be working hard and keeping the boat afloat, keeping the home made <laughs> or homemakers. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you have a job outside the home, well, you're being uh, diligent there. I mean, that's what diligence is, is working hard, being steady and faithful at your work and not making excuses, not killing time, but staying on task and offering it all to the Lord, which makes it a very joyful activity. And at the end of the day, I don't have an impressive list like of things I did, but I can check off not that I would, but I could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I did the laundry. I took care of grandpa. I made a lunch. I did those dishes. I did this. I did that. You know, I, I had a fruitful day. It's not super impressive, um, but it's faithfulness. And that's what faithfulness is. Uh, one thing that can get in the way of us being diligent is idleness. And you talk about that in your book. And my husband and I have been talking about recently of social media and how that can be a way of us being idle of, you know, I could sit down when my kids are doing something and it's relaxing, but I pull out my phone and I'm just being idle. I'm just looking through things that is not really important. And I, um, Risen Motherhood actually is going to be doing a mini series on how social media is affecting us today, that there is good in it, but most of the time where um, using it in a way that's not meaningful. And so if I'm sitting down with my phone, just scrolling through, you know, social media, I would rather pick up a book and have my kids see me reading and read to them than rather just be idle with the phone. So that's something that I've been trying to work on is the phone use in front of the kids and being idle. But I would say certainly being on your phone and cruising around looking for entertainment is a way, can be a waste of time. I have a pretty limited friends list or, a, you know, I just, but it's a real blessing for me actually to skim through and see what people in our congregation are doing, um, where they went on vacation and what birthday they're celebrating. You know, I don't spend a lot of time, but I get the mm -hmm. updates on prayer needs and I see a lot of, I, I would say really good information that's helpful. I mm -hmm. might, uh, I might notice a funny like wildlife video as I go by that I pause and that's just pure entertainment. It's like, well, that's yes. funny and I show it to someone else. Um, yes. So I think that there's a usefulness. It can mm -hmm. be very useful and it's nice to put our feet up. I mean, there's reading can be also very relaxing. So I don't think mm -hmm. we need to be too fussy about it. But if we're on it all the time, of course, it's ridiculous. But I like to do a quick overview so I know what's going on with my people. <laughs> my kids yes. will lose things. We started a chat group for all the mm -hmm. people in our family that have phones, which includes quite a few of my grandkids now. And so it's a family chat, you know, and I can check that. I can, I have a prayer group, chat group, you know, so I'm checking that when I get a notification. So it's a very useful tool and I really appreciate it. 
So I think we need to use it wisely, of course, mm -hmm. because we can turn anything into a waste of time, you know, yes. if pretty much anything, maybe not everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true of using it um, for the good things, for, like you said, checking up on people. And if it's just something to just pass the time away when there's other things to be done, you know, well, that can sure. be a hindrance. But Sure, um, but if, like if said, I can just sit down for a minute to relax yes. or look up that recipe or Google, how do you do that yes. thing that I need to do? Uh, absolutely, yes, it can Very be a help. Yes. All right, our next topic is contentment. So your book, uh, Learning Contentment, was the first one that I had read on that subject. And it's been a tremendous blessing to me through the years. And so what is it and how do we learn about contentment from the Apostle Paul? All right. Well, there's a little, that's a little bit of a question, isn't it? It's a great question. It's a big question. I started reading about contentment. I read a couple of books by the Puritans, which were collections of sermons on contentment. The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. Am I on? Is it oh? Yes. It's Are you hearing me? You're kind of frozen. Yes. Okay. Oh. Um, so I read Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, and then Thomas Watson's The Divine Art of Christian Contentment. And they were just transformative for me. It was like changing my worldview as a Christian mm -hmm. on how to interpret God's sovereign will over our lives and how to get under his feet and and worship him and thank him for all that comes to pass and so forth. And then I read All Things for Good by Thomas Watson also. So I wanted to write something that was maybe just a little um, easier for women to jump into that wasn't written in the 17th century. <laughs> and so that's why I wrote the book. I think a short definition of contentment is a deep satisfaction with the will of God in everything. And so getting our hearts to be satisfied with what he's doing is the goal of contentment. And just like the other virtues, we cannot achieve contentment or um, climb the hill till we reach contentment, you know, apart from the grace and goodness of God. It's a work of grace in our hearts. But uh, one of the, the shorthand things I mentioned is in discovering how to start learning about contentment. Make a list of all the things you have that you don't want and all the things you don't have that you do want, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you have, um, you know, some illness, that's something you have that you don't want. Uh, or maybe you really want a bigger apartment, but you don't have one. So you, you go through these things and you, Thank God for all the things that you have that you don't want and ask him to help you turn a profit on it. And you mm -hmm. thank him for all the things that you want and you don't have and pray that you can just be satisfied with what he's doing in you. Mm -hmm. And I think with a contented heart, then we're in a position to pray for deliverance, to pray for uh, the things that we want, the ask, seek and knock. Uh, but we're doing it from a contented, not a discontented attitude. And it just makes our lives so much more comfortable when we're content. Because discontentment is just like turbulent waters. And the devil loves to fish in troubled waters. And so it leads to many other sins. And it's not comfortable. It's uncomfortable. So learning to get under God's feet and thank him for what's happening and look for him in the affliction or whatever it is, that's learning contentment. And we're all going to be learning it all our lives. It's not a course where you get the diploma. <laughs> it's an ongoing sanctification, just like all the other virtues. That answer your question? Yes. <laughs> um, in your book, Learning Contentment, you write about being stressed out and how that's just an easy excuse that we have of, well, I'm just stressed mm -hmm. out for if you're angry or um, you're worried, unsettled, but it really is a sin that we should be looking at that as you're discontent right. with what's happening. And so I think about that when I want to say that I'm stressed out, 
just taking a step back. Good, good. All right, what's my heart great. attitude? And <laughs> you mentioned Jeremiah Burroughs and mm -hmm. uh, the rare jewel of Christian contentment has been a blessing in my life. And I ordered it because of your book and that, you know, good. you um, wrote an introduction in it. And so sometimes this is the first book by a Puritan that I have read. And it's just wonderful. One uh, quote that he has that I think about often is, the shoe may be smooth and neat without, whilst the flesh is pinched within. There may be much calmness and stillness outwardly, and yet wonderful confusion, bitterness, disturbance, and vexation within. And that's mm -hmm. so true how you can act outwardly like you're calm and you're trusting the Lord, but it truly is a heart, a heart thing. It's a heart issue and where your heart is. And so I, I've really enjoyed that illustration by him. Well, the gentle, quiet spirit, I believe is a contented spirit. It's just like looking at a glassy lake. It's beautiful and it just reflects the sky above it. It, it reflects God's glory and goodness, but it's quiet and resting. It's not like a woman with a gentle, quiet spirit may not speak. <laughs> it's about her inward peace and rest. And she can be very chatty and joyful, but it's, mm -hmm. she has a quiet spirit. It's not stressed out. It's not all those things you mentioned. Yeah. Pinched in different ways. Right. That's right. Another virtue that we don't hear of often is prudence. So why is having a prudent wife a prize from the Lord? Well, because she's very rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a prudent wife is a cautious wife. Uh, it's, a, it's a wise wife. A prudent wife is wise and can be trusted. Her husband doesn't have to worry about what's going on uh, when he's not there. So... A prudent wife is a gift from God. She's not a ding dong or a, uh, you know, a woman that he can't trust. That maybe she's, you know, racking up a lot of credit card debt behind his back. You know, she, prudent mm -hmm. wife is cautious. She's a prize. And, you know, the Lord says that if a man finds one of those, he's blessed. You know, so that it's an, it's not a word we use a lot, prudence. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean she's fearful, like she's cautious and won't do anything, won't step up more than one step on the ladder. You know, mm. it's not that kind of caution. It's just a prudent caution, a wise caution. And uh, she's not worrisome. She's wise. Mm. And that's when I read your book, I went back through in Proverbs and just looked at how many times that being prudent is mentioned mm -hmm. and it's just an abundance full and i think of proverbs 14 15 the simple believes everything but the prudent gives thought to his steps so it's thinking through our actions and not being gullible right and so i think about that of just not believing mm -hmm. everything that you hear but really giving thought to it all right next well it used to be correct. oh you, okay. i'm sorry Oh, go on. I'm sorry. I was going to say prudence used to be a common name we don't really use anymore because prude sounds sort of not uh, mm -hmm. complimentary. <laughs> but yes. I don't know if that grew out of the other. But prudence mm -hmm. is a lovely word, and it, it's something we should think about. Yes, that's right. All right, next is courage. How important is it for us to be courageous women? Well, I'm going to say it's mighty important. Of course it is. Um, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said courage is the testing point of all the virtues. So mm -hmm. how strongly do you feel about honesty? And, and let's say you're in a really tight spot. You need courage to test that virtue of honesty. You know, so courage is the testing point of all the virtues. So, of course, today in our world that's gone a little sideways, to say it mildly, we need a lot of courage to do what we know is right. We've had to have 
pastors who had courage to keep meeting in person, uh, mm -hmm. pastors who had courage to um, not shut down, among other things. And so it's it's gonna it's been really good for us to mm -hmm. have to be courageous on things like going to church. <laughs> yes, things we've right. taken for granted, and it's it's going to be. It's obviously going to become uh, more of a testing point all the time. So we want to be courageous women, not scaredy cats, not timid, not easily frightened. Now, I just found the evidence this morning of a mouse in the pantry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to need a little courage there, don't you think? <laughs> Oh, yes. So that there, would be difficult. Ah, so and gratitude and contentment and all the things. So it can be a little thing like he chewed up a corner of my new bag of coffee, which was not a cheap bag of coffee. And it was a big bag of coffee. So anyway, um, so I got out the traps. <sighs> but Oh. It can be courage in the little things and not freaking out, okay? And it can be yeah. courage in the very big things when you have uh, someone who's really ill, when you're going through a financial crisis, when you're being persecuted, and so forth. But it is, the mouse is a funny example, but I do have to exercise some of these virtues <laughs> yes. as I'm dealing with rodents, even rodents. That, so yes. not, not my favorite, but I think, well, Lord, did you send him into the pantry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I will try to turn a profit on this one. <laughs> uh, one book that I thought of when thinking of courageous women was the book Radiant by uh -huh. yes. Richard Hanala. Yeah. And that has been, it's 50 remarkable women in church history. And so that was one of the first books that I had read about a lot of martyrs of the faith mm -hmm. who were women and right. how courageous they were that they stood fast in the faith and they mm -hmm. didn't falter when it was difficult. Right. And I felt, found a lot of encouragement from their courage right. and their faith. And so that is one that um, sometimes I'll read little bits to Gracie because these are courageous women that I want her to be like. Right. Um, so we want to imitate them. We want to imitate our mothers where they have been courageous and our grandmothers and so forth. And we want to, we can't know how we will act in a time of great, when we need great courage. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if we're practicing it now, then that's how we prepare with the things that come up. Right. And so it's a, it's really healthy and good for our souls to have to stand up and not care what people think or what lies people are telling about us, but to have courage and faith and stick, you know, stick with the word, stick with the word, reading the word and not draw back in shame or hide away, but to hold your head up and say, I know who I am and I'm not afraid of you. I, you talk often in your podcast, Femina, of thanking God for your trials, of just thanking him and asking for this to be for your good and his glory. And so when things are difficult, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think back to that often of first, I need to remember to thank the Lord for this and that right. it may be for right. our good and to have the courage to go through this trial and hopefully be able to look back and see what the Lord did in our lives during that time. Absolutely. But to be praying for courage right now, as we're walking, yes. as something's coming up and that's right. I may still get the jitters inwardly in a yeah. dicey situation, but that isn't sin. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just emotions. Right. Okay. Right. So you can still feel jittery while you're being courageous. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if, you know, we didn't get those jitters, <laughs> but, but it's not a sin in themselves. It's just that mm -hmm. we're growing up. Yes. That's a good way of looking at it. All right. So let's talk about kindness. 
What are a few traits of kindness and why should we be kind to those who are unkind to us? <laughs> well, you know, I can answer that by saying, because God said, Emily. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> he said to do that. <laughs> so that's why we are kind to our adversaries, because God is. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust, and so we're to imitate him. So we are to be kind. We are, I wrote down a few things. Generous, lending, even if we don't think we'll ever get it back hospitable, affectionate, thoughtful, slow to anger. So kindness is not flattery. There's a big distinction yes. there. It's not just, oh, you look so cute. That's not, it could be kind. I'm not saying it isn't, but if it's flattery, it's not kindness. Because maybe, okay, I was in a restroom one time at a church and it was a wedding, I believe. And um, a woman was in there with some unnatural hair color. I don't know if it was hot pink or orange or, you know, I mean, she'd done that to her hair. And a Christian sister came in and said, oh, I love your hair, your hair color. And I thought, no, you don't. You should not. Mm -hmm. You know, why you're just say you're just trying to flatter her and you mm -hmm. think you're just being kind. Do you see that? Yes. And, and she goes away thinking, wow, well, maybe I will keep doing my hair turquoise. You know, she said it looked really great. So it's not flattery. It is um, sometimes kindness is telling someone the truth that they really need to hear mm -hmm. instead of just patting them on the head. Um, sometimes kindness is a meal or it's sitting down to listen or, you know, there's just so many ways to express it. But mm -hmm. it has to start in your heart. And of course, our children, our husbands should be the first recipients of our kindness before we look outside for more. I think a lot of people think if they just give to this charity or something that they are being kind. They can write a check and that there's our kindness for the year. Mm -hmm. And the Christian knows better that kindness is lived out, feet on the ground, so often at great sacrifice where you're giving of yourself and you're giving your stuff and you're opening your door and you're giving your time and so forth. Mm -hmm. This uh, chapter on kindness, I when Gracie was a little over two, or maybe she was just turning two, I would read to her parts of whichever book I was reading because her brother was usually napping and we needed to be quiet. And so I was reading this chapter and she started just saying all the time, God is kind, Dada, God is kind, and Mama, God is kind. And she would just repeat it because she picked that up from reading this book. And even mm -hmm. to this day, when she's talking about what God is, she remembers that God is kind. And it's just a sweet memory that I have with, with this book great. and that chapter in particular. That's, mm -hmm. That's good. Another virtue is loyalty. So why is it impossible to be loyal to the world and to the world? I'm, I'm sorry, to the world and the Lord. Okay. Well, because the world hates God. Mm -hmm. So we love God and we hate sin. And the world does not love God. So we can't love the world and love God. That's just, we're not to be friends with the world. We're not to let the world press us into its mold. We're to have our minds renewed so that we are not imitators of the world. So we're, we are at odds with the world as Christ was. And so we are to imitate him again. And we're to love God and hate sin. And that's straight up the middle. Black and white is pretty easy. So, I mean, it's easy to define, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Loyalty is a stubborn steadfastness serving the Lord, a stubborn steadfastness. So I'm going to be stubbornly steadfast to my family, loyal to my family. We taught our children to be loyal to one another as they were growing up, that you don't tell embarrassing stories about your brother or your sister to people. You know, you've got their back. You're loyal. You're steadfast. And certainly to my husband, when I was first mm -hmm. married, 
most all, well, really all my friends were single, but I met a few married ladies and I went to my first married Bible study, you know, so wives Bible study group. And everybody went around complaining about their husbands. And I was so shocked because I thought, well, I got a good one. I mean, I'm sorry about all of you. <laughs> it's <laughs> what a drag. But I learned that that is kind of the MO. Like that's what women just do mm-hmm. is they share, they're not loyal. And they share mm-hmm. things about their kids. They're not loyal. And it's one thing to share a cute story about your children that they wouldn't mind. But it's another thing to tell a story that they would mind very much, you know, mm-hmm. um, or making fun of them. So loyalty starts at home to our husbands and to our children. And then to it, it spreads out. But our loyalty obviously is to God first, which is why we're loyal to our husbands and children, our families. Mm-hmm. You mentioned steadfastness and it's firm and unwavering. And the kids and I are reading through Job right now. And we just read uh-huh. today um, in chapter 10, verse 12, you have granted me life and steadfast love and your care has preserved my spirit. And so just thinking of, of course, everything that Job has went through, yet he has the steadfast love for the Lord. And it's, like you said, stubborn. It's continuing through the hard the hard trials. All right, let's... All right, now is modesty. So should it be followed by a set of rules, or is it more of a matter of the heart? Total set of rules. For sure. You come up with them and print them out and (laughs) follow them to a T. It's so easy to go to the rules, but Mm -hmm. modesty is more complicated than that. It's a sign of wisdom, right? So rules, sometimes we have to have rules. Let's say in a school, you have to, here's the uniform. This is what you have to wear. I understand that. But we want to dress like we are chaste women. So we are looking like women who are either chased before marriage or chased after marriage. You know, chased being a one man woman, uh, not an adulteress. So a faithful, loyal, sexually pure before marriage and after marriage, sexually pure. So that's what I want to dress like. Um, <clears throat> someone mentioned to me the other day a, um, you know, a, a Christmas party from the past and which they did not enjoy because there was way too much wine and there were some pretty skanky outfits, you know, and no one has fun. It's like, it's, mm-hmm. it wasn't fun. There was too much alcohol and there were stupid women dressed in mm-hmm. stupid outfits. Okay. So we want to dress like chaste women, not like hot numbers, you know, and that's really challenging. I know today to find clothes that are not, um, you know, like prairie muffin outfits, but are chased. And you can, if you look, you can find, you can find it. Um, so I think a woman who wants to look chaste, who wants to look pure, she's going to come up with her own rules. Like, well, no, that's too short. That's too tight. When I bend over, this happens. When I sit down, that happens. I don't want that to happen. You know, I have more self-respect than to go out in that outfit. All right. And and I want to honor God, obviously. So modesty is more about you and your heart than about pleasing everybody else and stumbling people and so forth. But a woman who's dressed inappropriately can make people feel very uncomfortable. So it is about loving your neighbor also. But we don't want to spend too much time on the list of rules because I have heard this before. So where is that in the Bible? Where does it say I can't wear a bikini? Mm. And show me the verse. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at some verses. Right. Chaste and modest. And so why would you do that? So. I hope that helps. I, we want to dress ourselves in good works, mm-hmm. and that includes our clothes, of course, but it doesn't start there. It's like it is putting on good works, putting on Jesus Christ, and then when we get dressed, we look like we belong to him and not to the other team. That's, 
Yes, that's right. All right, our last virtue we will talk about is patience. Oh, so good. in <laughs> in what areas of our life should we strive to be patient? Is there one where we aren't supposed to use patience? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, well, long suffering is what patience is. You know, it's suffering for a long time. So we have to use patience with the little things. If you find a mouse in your pantry, well, it's going to require some patience. It's going to require some courage. It's going to require a lot of these virtues. It's just basic Christian living, right? 101. So patience is another fruit of the spirit. God is a long suffering God. He has suffered long with all of us. He's patient with all of us. And so we want to imitate him. We want to be mothers who are patient and extend comfort and kindness to our children, our husbands, and then extend it onward. If you're in traffic and you're getting all churned up, well, you need some patience. If you're in line and the person ahead of you is, you know, dropping things and forgetting things and dawdling out, you know, you need patience. And people need patience with you. You're behind that car that's going so slowly. Just gather some patience up and laugh. I mean, enjoy it. Say, Lord, you wanted me to be late to this meeting. And thank you, you put me behind this car. You know, you did this on purpose. You're wanting me to grow in this area. So it's a good thing to teach your children, but they have to see it in you first, of course. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in all these things, confessing our sin when we fail. Please forgive me for being impatient. I sounded impatient because I was impatient. And that was a mm -hmm. sin. Please forgive me. I mean, even if it is at the grocery store where you're snapping at somebody before mm -hmm. you leave, you should turn around and go back and apologize to that cashier or that person that was in line or, you know, put it right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry that I spoke that way to you. That was unkind. Please forgive me. And I tell you, you won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, well, that's something we need to think about is that patience is and should be in every area of our life. You hear, or I hear sometimes that, well, I, I lose my patience often, you know, in traffic, like you had talked about, but it's something that we brush off and it's just mm -hmm. an excuse because it can get very difficult to be in traffic with people who are going slow or whatever the case may be, but it's really in all areas that we need to be working in patient or working on being patient. And so just one sing, area a, sing a song. Yeah. Yes. Put on some music. <laughs> That's right. That, and that is helpful. And we've done that mm -hmm. before um, in the car. Also uh, I was re recently listening to one of your episodes talking about how uh, you didn't, raising your kids, you didn't want to be a no mom. You wanted to be a yes mom. And mm -hmm. I know for myself, when I'm losing patience, I can quickly say no to like everything. Just no, 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 no. You know, just sit down and do this. Right. Right. But you had said to um, just say, let me think about it. Let me think about mm -hmm. it for a moment. And that helps give me pause to really think about it and think about where my heart is you know, and also for your kids to have them practice patience. And so it's kind of gone both ways of it's helping me and it's also helping them. So that was uh, a great encouragement from you know, listening so to one of your episodes. Good. Yes. I've learned so much from your podcast and I encourage everyone listening to um, go and listen because I love how they're short. They're mm -hmm. to the point. They lead you back to scripture and I can listen to it at any point of the day. And it's just, it's quick, it's encouraging. And it's, um, it's just been a real help in my life. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Emily. All right. So now we'll do my one question that I ask all of my guests. It's fruit for your home. And so it is, what is one of your family favorite recipes that you'd like to share? All right. I had to think about this one a little bit, but I would say it's what my family calls the childhood bread I made as they were growing up. Uh -huh. And 
I've been making it again recently. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. It's not, I did a stint with sourdough for a while and then my starter just got out of fellowship. <laughs> so I thought, well, fine, I'm just going to go back and make the old childhood bread with the yeast and the kneading and the whole thing. So mm -hmm. I have a copy of the recipe. I, it's like I wrote this long ago because on the top it says, I don't, I'm sure you can't say it, but it says Nathan. Oh, yes. <laughs> My son wrote that on there. It says, you have to kind of figure out what it says, but it says to mom. Oh. <laughs> so I'll never, I will always preserve this one. So yes. this was probably, That's sweet. he was probably writing that like in when he was, well, he was just learning to write. So he's probably like five years old or something. But mm -hmm. and his spelling, spelling is great. But anyway, it's, you don't want me to read the whole recipe to you, do you? No, I can, I can okay. just, yeah. I'll post it. So, but yes, that okay. sounds it's wonderful. Just, yeah, it's just a whole wheat bread recipe and you can okay. vary the ingredients. You can do two cups of whole wheat or four, you know, you, you just do. I used to have leftover oatmeal in the pan mm -hmm. in the morning that and I just throw in the dough. And I made it once a week. It makes six loaves in the smaller, not the wow. ginormous bread pans, but just the little okay. average size ones. And um, then I would save some out for Rachel because she was the youngest. She mm -hmm. was home. The other two were at school. And she would make a little loaf in a little teeny bread pan. Aww. Or she'd make a little man, a little bread man. And we would, you know, put that in the oven. And then, of course, honey butter is mm -hmm. a, something you all need to have when you're serving homemade bread. And it's just equal parts butter and honey, but make sure the butter is soft, not melted. So you can whip the honey butter, you can whip the honey into the butter. That's it. Well, well, thank you because I have not ventured into sourdough yet because I just don't know mm -hmm. if I can keep the starter. Yeah, so keep I'm it going. Always... <laughs> well, yes. it is. It's really fun to make sourdough. It, it, it is. But I also love this bread baking as well. So okay. either one and you can put right. molasses in it or honey, whatever you want. It's very flexible. Okay. Well, I will make sure to post that to our social media. Okay. And also, if you'd like to learn more about Nancy's book, I will be sharing the link uh, down below. And... Thank you again, Nancy, for joining me on this podcast. It has been just such a joy to have you. And well, thank you. Next time you come to Moscow, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, we were talking about before we started the podcast about uh, my husband and I went to Grace Agenda for the first time this year, and it was just wonderful. The families there worshiping the block party was so much fun. So uh, we definitely want to be coming again next year. Um, but if you're listening, please follow on Instagram and you can subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And thank you again for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this episode was helpful for you. And if this uh, podcast has been a blessing to you, um, I would be so grateful if you would leave a review and share uh, the podcast. You can follow us on social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook, and don't forget to follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And I hope you have a blessed day.